I think we would be going online now, so we can go ahead with speaking. All right. Great. Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the CSMVS Museum and the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard, a very warm welcome to our viewers and our amazing group of panelists that we've been able to welcome today. This is the second of a two-part lecture series that we have organized. Uh, last week, there was a lecture which focused on the development of science and its impact on the field of art conservation. And we heard from global experts in this area. And this today, we are going to be focusing more on South Asia as a region and the work happening in, in art conservation here. I think what we learned from last week was the importance and value of sharing knowledge, even if it is unfinished, particularly in this area, because so much of work happens, but it tends to be in silos. And so the collaboration part of it was equally important that was emphasized by our panelists and translation of knowledge. That is, what are we learning from the field, whether it's vocabularies or techniques, how does that get documented and disseminated? So many of these things happen and what we started to identify uh, between the CSMVS Museum and the Mittal Institute, which serves as a knowledge hub, is there's a huge opportunity for sharing information. And what we have launched with these two panels uh, last week and with this week, is a program, what we're calling conservation science training and research. And the idea behind this is to create some sort of a knowledge hub on heritage conservation in South Asia, to be able to organize resources that we are actually learning from the field, but also from our academics on conservation practices and the science and research behind it. And lastly, for all of us to become advocates through the sharing of knowledge amongst the historians, scientists, museum professionals around the world. And so with that in mind, we, we are coming together in this pilot year to offer a training program, which would focus on the technical aspects of art history. And you'll hear some of this today in our conversation and also on the scientific studies involved in conservation related to South Asian art. The program that we're thinking about will mix a combination of theory and practice. And then lastly, the idea is that we want to support institutions and individuals who are very keen on building basic facilities for art conservation, and then also for students who are currently engaged in museum studies uh, in and around South Asia. We've set up a, uh, an email and uh, we can put that on the chat. If you have further questions related to the program, please feel free to reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. And moving quickly on to today's program, because we have just an amazing lineup of speakers. Um, just a little bit on the CSMVS as our partner. Uh, Mr. Mukherjee, who, as we all know, has been the director of the museum. So for the last 13 years or so, he has transformed the institution, not just to become sort of a, a, a place where one comes to view art and understand our heritage, but because it's become an institution of learning, a place of research and a, a hub for civic engagement. And uh, along with Mukherjee, Mr. Mukherjee, there's an amazing team that supports him, works with him. And Anupam Sa, who you, you'll hear from today and is moderating the panel, has been a partner uh, at the museum, but also with the Lakshmi Mittal Institute in terms of thinking beyond uh, you know, what, what I've just outlined that we are interested in doing in the coming years. So um, uh, Anupam, as uh, some of you may know, or many of you may know, uh, is a 
conservation consultant and specialist. He heads the art conservation research and training at the CSMVS Museum in Mumbai. He is uh, both an educator as well as a practitioner. He thinks in a very broad systems approach, which essentially means looking across the silos, looking across the disciplines in, 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 in his practice. Um, he has helped develop the CSMVS's state-of-the-art facilities for conservation and its lab. And without further ado, Anupam, I turn the event over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meena. Uh, thank you for the introductions. Um, and a very good day, ladies and gentlemen, and dear panelists, and to all our diverse audiences from around the world. Um, we're here together for this panel discussion related to developing a training program in conservation science and research uh, with artistry as a very intrinsic part of it and with special reference to this sector in South Asia. And before we commence, uh, Mr. Sabisachi Mukherjee, Director General of CSMVS, has asked me to thank Mr. Tarun Khanna and Yumina and the Mittal Institute for partnering with CSMVS on this venture. And he conveys his gratitude to the audience as well as to all the experts on the panel for accepting this joint invitation. And um, Meena, with your permission, I have the privilege of now introducing the panel for this evening. Um, uh, we have with us um, Anusha, um, Anusha Kasturiakshi, uh, who is an archaeological conservator um, from Sri Lanka and is currently researching the Sri Lankan ancient, Maritime, ancient bronzes. Uh, she has been working with the Department of Archaeology as head of conservation in uh, Maritime Archaeology Project. Uh, from our conversations that we had prior to this panel discussion, I got to know that she also has um, a backgrounds in the biosciences, and she's been uh, a visiting fellow of the Leon Levy Foundation uh, for Archaeological Material Conservation at New York University, as well as the Anna de la Genta, uh, Conservation Research Fellow at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, um, Anusha also works on authenticity issues related to Sri Lankan artifacts. Uh, welcome, Anusha. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have with us, of course, um, Dr. Gina Kim, who is the George P. Bickford Professor of uh, Indian and South Asian Art, Department of Art and Architecture at Harvard University. Uh, Professor Kim's research and teaching interests cover a broad range of topics with a special interest in um, text image relationships, female representations and patronage, uh, reappropriation of sacred objects, and post-colonial discourse in the field of South and Southeast Asian art. In fact, we're looking at her in this entire program to bring in the um, bring in the amalgam, so to speak, of art history uh, into the fold uh, as we venture into this conservation and science program. Um, Kim has a lot of uh, publications to accredit and they explore topics such as female patronage of Buddhist art in medieval South Asia, as well as the development of visual vernaculars in um, Indian, man Indian manuscript painting, um, as well as things like reappropriation of religious sites like Angkor Wat. Uh, in addition to her academic research, um, Kim is also developing a digital humanities project on color and uh, we hope that it will serve as an online portal and a searchable open database for existing and future research on pigments. Thank you so much, uh, Kim, Dr. Gina Kim. Dr. Sharda Srinivasan, she is a professor at the School of Humanities um, at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. Um, she has made pioneering contributions in the scientific study of art archaeology and archaeometallurgy. Um, Sharda is a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain, as well as of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has numerous awards, research awards, the Homi Baba Fellowship, uh, the UK India Education and Research Initiative Award, the Dr. Kalpana Chawla Young Women Scientist Award. Uh, Sharda, I can't list out all of them. But I must mention that um, she's also an accomplished Bharatanatyam dancer and gives numerous lecture demonstrations. 
And in 2019, we were all happy that her work was acknowledged and she received the Padma Shri for her contributions to the field. Uh, welcome, Sharda. Uh, Brigadier General Vijay Kumar Shahi um, um, is uh, the founder chairman of um, International Council of Museums, ICOM Nepal, and um, uh, also the former senior chair of the Nepal Museum Association. We're so happy that um, Brigadier General Shahi could join us uh, for this evening. And after more than three decades of military service with the Nepalese army, uh, including multiple United Nations peacekeeping missions, um, he has been affiliated with the military museum. Brigadier uh, Shahi is also the museum advisor of the first aviation museum of Dhangari and has a vast knowledge of museology and related subjects, which he brings to the fore as an independent advisor and consultant on these issues. A warm welcome to you, sir. We have uh, Vinod with us and, uh, Ms. and uh, Mr. Manager Singh. Uh, I'll introduce Mr. Manager Singh first. He is the Director General of the National Research Laboratory for Conservation, uh, commonly um, lovingly known as the NRLC, uh, based at Lucknow um, uh, in the state of Uttar Pradesh. He was just before this, in fact, uh, he was also the professor and head of the Department of Conservation at the National Museum Institute uh, in New Delhi and uh, superintending archaeological chemist at the Archaeological Survey of India for over 25 years. Uh, and that was one, one period when he built up a lot of extensive field experience and he has, he's now printing a lot of research papers related to uh, that time and uh, for many years he was at the uh, world heritage site of Ajanta, the Ajanta um, uh, wall painting site. And um, his various research papers deal with scientific studies of conservation of heritage, antiquities, studies of pigments, plasters and other materials. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Manager Singh. And Vinod Daniel. Um, Vinod Daniel um, has been um, He's helped us a lot in also working uh, with the panel here and uh, getting everyone together. Uh, always, he's always there to help and um, support any efforts in this part of the subcontinent and internationally. He's a recognized museum specialist around the world. For over 20 years, he has been with the Australian Museum Sydney and for over a decade with the J. Paul Getty Trust in LA in collection related roles. And, um, He's also worked as an independent specialist in over 50 countries uh, and has been involved with a lot of professional networks. Other than his other various responsibilities, he's the chairman of the board of Aus Heritage. Uh, he is the chief executive officer of Daniel Aspect Proprietary Limited and um, the board member, a board member of the International Council of Museums. Um, he's also worked with the Center for Environmental Education um, for the Australian operations. Uh, and uh, he's the CEO of India Vision Institute, which is doing yeoman's work uh, service uh, across the country uh, as, a, as, a, as a social organization, so to speak. Uh, Vinod has conducted numerous workshops, more than 100 workshops. He's got more than 90 technical papers. And, uh, and uh, he's a darling of the media. He's always quoted by the media. So welcome, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Vinod. Um, to get down to the subject straight away, uh, this is about um, having a conversation about creating a training program in conservation science that straddles art history as well as the practical aspects of art conservation. And this is about South Asia. South Asia, where, where art is much is tangible, but where art is extremely rich in its intangible aspects also. This is about art in South Asia, where there are pressing sectors competing for common resources. We're all developing countries. There are pressing issues of livelihoods. So where we talk about art, we talk about conservation of art, and now we're talking about conservation science. So 
putting across the um, conversation for all of us to wade in. Um, I wonder what is there a place for conservation science? And in, in uh, of course there always is. But what are your thoughts on this place for conservation science in South Asia at the moment in our different countries? And I introduced Vinod right um, um, uh, in the end of the series of the panelists. So may I request Vinod if you could um, begin the conversation with um, addressing this statement. So, uh, you know, could I, I got disconnected for about five seconds because the internet just flicks. So, could you just repeat your question again? Yes, it's it's one of the joys of uh, yes, of the joys. It's a privilege, like uh, you know, Peter Sellers would have said, it was a it's a privilege to be able to have another conversation with you, Peter, <laughs> with <him and> Daniel. <laughs> so, just wondering that in a place like South Asia, where there are so many competing issues, where there are issues of livelihoods, where there are resources that um, different sectors are competing for, uh, where we are talking about tangibles and intangibles in a place like South Asia, where even the question of conserving art is, um, is something to consider, you know, with the thinking cap, whether we should do it and, you know, is it worth doing it? We're talking now about um, Art, art conservation, and now conservation science, and talking about putting in resources for this and time into this and getting people together. Is there a place for conservation science also? Um, I think it's it's a very difficult question. Um, see, I mean, I've actually spent close to maybe three decades looking at at conservation in many parts of the world, and including India. Um, I think conservation is emerging in India. It's still very young. Uh, it'll probably take at least a decade more before it reaches a stable level where it's got a strong voice globally. You know, the kind of voice that you see happening in many countries. And I guess that would be one of the, the first priority is getting conservation established as a, a, a profession that that you know stands in par with many other professions. Now, with conservation science, um, you know it is going to contribute to conservation. Uh, I remember, um, you know, uh, at least maybe 10, 20 years back, there was a lot of discussion globally on even developing a new curriculum for conservation science. That means trying to train a scientist right from scratch to become a conservation scientist. I think for a place like India, maybe it's too early for things like that. Here, I think the approach needs to be where scientists, I mean, in terms of recruitment, whether it's Archaeological Survey of India or many other museums, scientists are recruited to be part of, of uh, conservation. It is how you really train them in some ways that the outcome from what they do is useful for the long-term preservation of collections. Research as such should be just basic research. It should be applied research that would translate into something good with regard to the care of collections. And if that extra angle could be brought in, I think it'll, it'll do a lot of good. I'm also probably qualifying that statement to say, look, the recruitment rules, there's a whole range of things that makes it already quite easy for scientists to become part of the museum sector, to become part of the museum, to uh, part of conservation. So this might be, you know, one way to go. The other thing also is, I mean, if you look at the major conservation uh, practices, um, it's quite um, resource intensive in terms of equipment. Uh, NRLC is probably one of the few examples where the infrastructure was done really well, but still maintaining that is not easy. You go to the West, you go to the Met, you go to any of the big museums, they have so much analytical equipment and other things. It's not going to be that easy for every museum in, in uh, you know, this part of the world to get that. But I think what's important out there is how do you leverage major 
institutions, educational institutions that do have the infrastructure. So it's great to have people like Sharda here in the panel, IIC, IITs, they all have great equipment. So how do you actually slowly get them into understanding what this field is and partner with them? I think some of these things would be uh, the low hanging fruits for the next 10 years. Maybe after that would be a good time to really think of having you know, independent conservation science you know, happening uh, in every institution. So those are my opening comments. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. You're talking, uh, Vinod talked about converging resources, right? And when we're talking about converging resources, one of the primary aspects that uh, the program is also looking at is about converging uh, the sciences. We were talking about converging art history and the sciences and conservation as a practice. And in the last panel discussion, social sciences was also brought into the form. So regarding this convergence with art, and because when you talked about converging um, um, the art history aspects of it, I saw a lot of nods from the panelists. So everybody tends to be in agreement with this. But if somebody would like to talk about um, about um, you know this bringing in together of this the sciences and the arts and art history into this, uh, I'll be very happy. So I leave it for you. Yeah, um, please. So Gina Sharda, please go ahead. Yeah, Gina, uh, maybe Gina could say, and then I could uh, talk. I think she. Please feel free. Please feel free. Uh, no, please. Oh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Anupam, and thank you, Vinod, and thank you to the panelists for joining. And uh, I just wanted to sort of start by kind of commenting on what Anupam you raised as a question about resources, and you know, is there a place for conservation science or even conservation of heritage in uh, South Asia where resources are limited, and like you know, there are pressing questions of livelihood, and and I think that is a really excellent question. And that really does uh, come to the heart of sort of where you can allocate resources and actually do something of uh, meaningful action for the uh, posterity. But just one thing to start off is really the importance of cultural heritage preservation for the communities that actually have these things. And, you know, it's not about uh, for the sake of keeping the beauty of it, it's really about the study of the past is something that uh, really gives hope and understanding of your own community. And I think that really does need to come to the sort of uh, floor of discussion that you really do have to consider. There is no, uh, you know, it's like what resources need to go where. It's uh, the uh, heritage preservation. It's like irrevocable act. If it goes, it's the past just does not come back. And I think doing it right, especially conservation based on research, and that's actually the most important part of it, that you can't just go in and like make it look nice. And it really does need to have a research base. Uh, and that actually comes with a good understanding of scientific background. And that's where the collaboration between art historians, conservation, scientists and conservators all come in together to really do it right, that it doesn't really have a, a negative consequence in for the pos posterity and the community that actually has these objects and the sites within their sort of um, and it. So that's what, I mean, I, I really have to advocate for like the importance of uh, heritage preservation and the study of the past uh, and how that actually is an important sort of ideologically and philosophically conceptually is an important thing for each community and that I, I really do passion feel passionate about really you know, supporting this cause so that's what, where I would open <laughs> Charada sorry I uh, rambled oh. on yeah no 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 that was uh, thank you very much uh, Gina and uh, that was very important and relevant points. And first of all, thank you also to, to the uh, Harvard South Asia Mittal Institute and uh, Anupam and all of you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, uh, well, I suppose, uh, you know, you all have already flagged off the very uh, critical and important uh, questions. And to add to that, I mean, uh, you know, when you think about it, 
Um, I, I suppose there are also these uh, different components to um, uh, conservation science as it is emerging. I mean, in a way in India, it also has quite a long history because you see some of the very early publications of people, uh, you know, for instance, in the Chennai Museum, which had set up uh, in an early um, conservation resource for those bronzes. And there were publications by people like Paramasivan and uh, Gravely and so on, going back to the 1940s and, and things like that. And of course, there's been uh, a lot that has been accomplished through the NRLC and the various intact um, um, institutes and uh, the, uh, the the conservation uh, institutes and contributions of uh, people like Dr. Ropi Agrawal and ongoing, uh, all of uh, you, Dr. Anupam, and so many um, uh, uh, scholars. But I guess that, um, you know, where I came in from, I, I think that, you know, for instance, I had a background which was actually in um, technology, you know, from IIT. And, uh, you know, so it seemed that there are uh, people who feel, you know, that their interests can lie in both the sciences and the arts. And so those kinds of people may be the ones who may, uh, you know, be tempted to go into conservation science. And we do need to also nurture that ability to, uh, you know, that aspect of interdisciplinarity of being able to converge these disciplines as we go along. Because then to, to some extent, though, it goes back to the problem where in India, where people then tend to think that, Okay, if you just, uh, you know, if there's some problem studying artifacts, you could just ask the scientists to give, uh, take it, to do it, and then the artifacts are just given over to some lab, you know, a scientific laboratory. But then, you know, the scientific laboratory by itself really would not have the wherewithal to just look in at, at an artifact. And for instance, with metals, you know, there are aspects like corrosions and things like that. And uh, you know, they may not be aware that there are certain kinds of elements you just would not, or compounds you just would not expect to see in antiquity, and it may have something to do with, you know, your standard rather than actually finding it in the artifacts. So there is a whole pedagogy that has gone into it over so many decades into how you approach the study, the scientific research of artifacts. So, um, and that's why you do need people who can, uh, you know, look at it at, at both sides. And at the same time, you know, what happens perhaps is that you have very good conservation scientists who may be publishing in all of these journals which relate to archaeo materials and so on. But then there is also the need to engage then with the uh, community of art historians and curators, because then again, it tends to perhaps go back into silos where, you know, the art historians would still like to maybe work with um, the epigraphic or the inscriptional evidence and also, you know, for instance, in, in my own uh, work, one of the points that, uh, you know, with the whole uh, statuary bronze tradition, uh, you know, which is Southern India and the, the Chola period and so on is, is very well known for. I mean, uh, since these were regarded as images and so on of deities, they were not really inscribed and so on. So you don't have, uh, you know, parameters by which you can perhaps attribute dates and so on, apart from just the visual analysis. So this is where the, um, uh, the analysis of the, the material uh, content, the material culture, and the materiality plays a role because then you know you you can there are traces you know whether it's lead ice chip analysis and something else and so on, which can actually help you to enhance even the ability for classification in terms of the art history and the curatorship and so on, and of course then it also becomes a challenge because you have to also publish in a way that is. Um, uh, that is acceptable across these various communities, both in the art historical uh, community as well as in the conservation science sphere and so on. So there is, it, it does become a responsibility, but this kind of conversation where we're actually trying to um, point to the need to actually, uh, you know, enhance this engagement between the curatorial world and the, the, the practitioners maybe in the conservation science is, is very important. And of course, in India, it's always, again, a battle with, uh, you know, the resources. And, you know, although it's it's good to, you know, we do have very good, perhaps scientific, um, you know, institutions that they are very, very, um, you know, they have their own, uh, uh, they're bogged down with their own deadlines and timelines of things to do. Whereas uh, the way it's developed in the West is often museums have these dedicated laboratories and, you know, the kinds of things that, uh, many of my colleagues are involved in like uh, with NRLC and Anupam which is building these dedicated labs to look at uh, the scientific analysis. And also I think what is happening here is also that the conservation practitioners are often perhaps now it's gone into more of, uh, you know, like 
NGO kind of, uh, you know, situation where they have their own practices and so on. So there is, and then again, the, the universities and all that are not perhaps engaging in that so much. There still is more of the traditional teaching of archaeology and art history without perhaps integrating these aspects more. So there is a lot of um, scope there definitely to, to enhance these kinds of dialogues. And so I think this is a very meaningful, uh, you know, way ahead to also look at the models in the West. But, and then of course, there is the aspect of the craft traditions, which, you know, in, in the West, you don't have those kinds of living craft traditions, which, and the, uh, you know, which could actually um, contribute in all of this and how to, you know, get, provide some value addition for their, uh, you know, for, for the livelihoods of the craftspeople and so on in terms of engaging them in all of this process. So, um, yeah, so it's a very challenging prospect there. Talking of craft traditions, I mean, if you see some of the most fantastic uh, um, metal crafts people who have enriched the entire Himalayan belt have come from Nepal. And uh, these are strong living traditions, Brigadish Shahi. Um, how are these there? Are they still strong, the traditions after the earthquake? And uh, how is it that the museum or ICOM uh, and other institutions in Nepal, how have they engaged with the living our traditions. Thank you very much, Anupam. Uh, as Anupam already said, basically I'm soldier. I'm not uh, very much engaged with this uh, me conservation. Conservation, yes, I know a little bit about the conservation because directly, indirectly, I'm engaged with the museum. As uh, Anupam said, I was the chairman of ICOM Nepal for three years. Then I'm also the member of ICOM Paris, France. So I have little bit knowledge about this uh, conservation. As you talk about the last earthquake, yes, in 2015, we have had the mega earthquake. At that time, we came to know what is the conservation because the many artifact, many objects, they were all on uh, with this mud and the brick, with the stone, all are messed with the debris. At that time, we recover, we rescued many objects, many artifacts of this museum. And for your information in Nepal, we have many museums, big museums, but most of the museum run by the government side. We have very little museum, very few museum. They are run by the private sector. And in government side, we have the category of museum, like the, some museum run by the federal government, some run by the, this, um, uh, what we call provincial government, and some museum are run by the local level, local government. So most of the museum, are in Kathmandu Valley, that is the capital of Nepal. And in that 2015 mega earthquake, we lost many objects, many artifacts from the museum. But after some time, most of them we recover also. At that time, we remember what is the conservation, what is the preservation of those objects and those artifacts. Then we start talking about the conservation, especially conservation of the artifact of the museum, not any other thing. Then we came to know what is the importance of conservation? What is the importance of preservation? At the time, I remember the team of ICC Rome from the ICOM side, ICOM France, they came to Nepal. They gave training to our museum people about the conservation how to do conservation. Then we also slowly start learning about the conservation. And we came to know what is the importance of conservation, especially in the time of disaster like earthquake we have had. So as you said, the conservation science, yes, of course, conservation science, it is in, encompasses many things, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, art history, anthropology, Everything it is there. Yes. But as you said, in South Asian country, even like we, 
country like Nepal, it is very far. The subject of conservation science is very far because we have to learn many things. We have to understand many aspects about the conservation science, which we don't have. We are very much lacking. So this is the situation. We simply not conservation, we are preserving the, this artifact and the object in our medium, especially in the time of disaster, as I said in the last 2015 hours. This is the condition. So I think we are very far from this conservation science, what we are talking about now. But like, a two, yeah, like a two soldier who's done a recce of the land, uh, like a true soldier who's done the recce of the land, yours is a very, very realistic and ground truthed assessment of the situation. And I appreciate your candidness in saying that, you know, we are very far removed from conservation science. You know, we have to go towards conservation first and other issues. That is true. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, but thank you very much because I think this brings a lot of perspective into this conversation. And uh, um, Anusha, um, Anusha, may I... Um, what about you, your own personal journey for this, um, you know, um, how you've taken this forward? You're an archaeological conservator, right? What is the status in Sri Lanka? How is it? Um, is it well-established conservation as a profession? There are issues just like uh, Brigadier Shahi said, and what in India also is the same situation, you know? The differences in language and English seems to be the only medium in which things are being disseminated just now. So it is not really permeating into the soil of the earth. You know, we are skimming the surface, so to speak. Um, and from my little forays into Sri Lanka for training and other things, we find there are some outstanding issues there too. What is the status like in Sri Lanka? Uh, thank you very much uh, for everyone. And uh, Actually, in Sri Lanka, uh, heritage science has been a uh, during the uh, Dr. Roland Silva started in the UNESCO Sri Lanka project in uh, uh, Sri Lanka, cultural triangle project. Mm -hmm. During that time, the heritage management and heritage science very uh, developed. And uh, that program started some uh, conservation uh, of cultural property training program and uh, uh, site uh, laboratory in the uh, island. So uh, in main laboratory in the Andradapura. So then they started some uh, conservation training program in uh, 1980s uh, with the uh, UCL uh, University College London. So uh, then they started training program and started uh, training conserva conservators. But mainly at that time, they choose some uh, advanced level uh, students for the that training program. Then they then generally uh, uh, get uh, qualified for other uh, degrees. So in an, actually, I am. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, be a medical doctor. So I started uh, uh, studying uh, bioscience stream. But uh, in the meantime, uh, after I got examination, in the meantime, I joined a postgraduate institute of archaeology in Sri Lanka to do part time. Um, training course in cultural pro conservation of cultural property. Uh, that uh, pro that uh, training uh, course was a certificate course one year in full time. So I joined that uh, training program and, and I started uh, training in conservation uh, uh, of cultural property. After that, uh, course, they joined the uh, cultural uh, triangle project for the on-job uh, training. Uh, so I joined that program and I stuck that program. So I 
actually changed my mind and I wanted to then uh, wanted to be an archaeologist. So I, I started my uh, degree with uh, archaeology and anthropology uh, in the meantime of the conservation. So in uh, then 1993, I started as a conservator in the, my first job. Then uh, during conservation, I thought uh, in Abegiri project has many stone artifacts. So there was a uh, site museum in, in, uh, in South Asia and uh, the uh, best uh, finest uh, stone object in there. So I thought uh, without geology, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, conserve object. We want to identify mineralogy. We want to identify stone. So it is uh, good to uh, learn some geology. So I, I uh, followed some geology course. Uh, then I thought uh, without more chemistry, it is difficult to um, uh, prepare some solution and the deterioration mechanism. So I thought to uh, learn some chemistry. So I follow some uh, chemistry, uh, diploma chemistry. So like that, I uh, accumulate my uh, qualification. And then uh, uh, later I hold a, a master of science in uh, architectural conservation So uh, and monuments. Uh, my thesis was actually underwater archaeological materials, six shipwreck uh, materials, especially waterlogged materials. So, in uh, my uh, internal supervisor was Ian Godfrey in the Western Australian Maritime Museum. So, then uh, uh, 2010, I received some uh, fellowship, Leon Levy Fellowship in the New York University. So uh, I uh, did uh, meti archaeological material conservation training program in the New York uh, University in the conservation center. Then I moved to the Metropolitan Museum as a conservation research fellow. And I did some uh, 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 bronze object uh, uh, research. And I did two publications. Uh, one publication with the uh, ICOM. So uh, also I uh, follow some museology course and archaeology diploma and such a lot of things. And also mm -hmm. I train as a, a conservation trainer in the art, uh, underwater archaeological uh, UNESCO field school and uh, prof professional development course, very workshop and uh, yeah informal courses I followed uh, because of in Sri Lanka there is no formal uh, master degree or uh, graduate degree for uh, conservation or conservation science. Uh, conservation and physics or chemistry based uh, graduates go in uh, separate line, art historian go in separate line. So uh, never uh, combine both of them in Sri Lanka. So it is very difficult to uh, artifact conservators or painting conservators uh, doing uh, uh, blend. Uh, uh, both of uh, these together. Yes. But so, uh, what Anusha is saying, and uh, um, actually I'm very happy that you gave us this complete, you know, from your personal experience, if you see, I think this is a very important issue. Uh, this development of an individual into this sector, it is very obvious from Anusha's very, very clear. And if you saw the long winding and circuitous way by destiny and by personal efforts, she has arrived at a certain position and she has great visions for doing things for Sri Lanka. But I think it tells a lot about the existing systems or the absence of them. And that dissociation between art history and the sciences, you know. So um, I think it's this is something to think about also when we are looking at a training program for South Asia. How is it that we can incorporate something into the systems in such a way?
that people have some avenues to go into and whether you know how can art historians or curators benefit from the scientific studies or how can the scientists then converge with um, uh, art historians and uh, mr manager singh has worked uh, in ajanta one of the most exquisite places where uh, uh, you know 2000 years ago they created these thousands and thousands and thousands of square feet of exquisite wall paintings which are still alive today with great perspective with great depth with great um, profusion of colors and great techniques so manager singh ji what about this thing about when this conversation happened about the sciences and the arts i mean there's a scientist a scientist obviously has to develop certain aspects of artistic this thing and uh, artists also can be trained into the practical aspects of conservation and then consult with other um specialist in conservation science what is your take on it you are the head of nrlc the premier research organization in the country thank you thank you uh, isko kar dena ha uh, anupam ji thank you so much uh, i have to say about the state of conservation in southeast asia and uh, i want to tell first thing that uh, nrlc was created 35 years back to fulfill the need of conservation of southeast asia by an, by an act of parliament mm -hmm. so we were actually created for the southeast asia as a conservation laboratory of course we have uh, till date we have uh, around 350 research publications i myself have the more than 100 research publication in very reputed journals uh what uh, around 450 persons we have trained in the field of conservation nrlc has trained so far and uh, these are the, there are the person from the other southeast asian countries also along with the people who are working uh, because the nrlc was created to 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 train people who are working in different uh, organization which are related to the uh, archaeology and these things uh, Uh, conservation and uh, studies so uh, nrlc is doing its uh, job but uh, what is more important when i reached uh, to ajanta i myself my experience i am telling i had basically no knowledge how to hold a brush brush i had no knowledge how to how to clean a paintings because asi archaeological oh, survey of india does not give you practical training how to clean it how to do it so i have to sit it back side of uh, my who so but my producers were doing that work and just i was seeing for two years how they hold the brush how they clean the paintings and after two years i just uh, uh, started working at ajanta to clean the i got i got enough courage to hold the brush it was so sensitive and uh, then uh, the buddha's blessings uh, i did some of the diff most difficult work uh, of preserving the cave number 10 the uh, hinayana paintings were uh, uh, seeing the result i was widely covered by the discovery channel uh, and all those things i discovered uh, so many things uh, regarding like uh, 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 cannabis sativa in the elora caves i i analyzed all the mud plasters of the buddhist caves where the paintings have been done on the mud plaster i have 25 30 uh, research papers uh, from different areas on the lime plasters uh, uh, of india but the thing is what is the research i have to approach different laboratories iit mumbai iit kanpur i cbri and these things because of the instruments what we have this is a 30 35 years back and most of the things we don't get is spare parts also so the what is lacking in this country or in southeast asia is a good conservation laboratory people are there i have different departments different department of metallography metal department of physics geology chemistry biochemistry analytical division uh, archival division and so many divisions are there with me but the thing is lack of a good analytical laboratory and i am telling 
from the beginning that if the, we get a good analytical laboratory, we can do a wonderful research. Uh, of course, my research are of very high standards that uh, uh, could be very good impact factors. But this is, uh, we are depending on other laboratory getting it analyzed and it takes time. So, of course, whatever the pigment analysis have been done uh, in India, most, uh, most of the analysis, uh, I think uh, it has been done by me only. Uh, 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 we have also that uh, I just discussed uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Anupam uh, afternoon that uh, we have written a book that how the transplant Presentation of the painting, salvages of the paintings, how you are going to undertake. Because the, the technique is just will forget about in few years. Because the last transplantation has taken place in 2010. Afterwards, the technique nobody knows. So I have written a 74 pages a booklet so that it will uh, revive the technique, people will come to know. We are making a, a, a booklet for the all the pigments used in India in different that we are in the process of uh, uh, making and publishing it. So those things we are doing at our level, but we 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 cannot have the approach. I have some samples from Sri Lanka, also pigment sample. So uh, 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 this is a, a approach. Uh, which is uh, uh, being done by me at the lo very local level. But uh, suppose if you want to really develop the conservation science in this uh, in this area, in the Southeast Asia, then we have to join together and make a very good, the dedicated efforts where the good analytical liberty, good scientists and some, and uh, NRLC, I open it to uh, everyone that NRLC is one of the, we have a very good facility, very good very big buildings, everything is uh, with us. So if we can develop it that as a, as a, as a center, along with the uh, CSBM, I think we can do wonderful job for the, for the entire region of this, uh, uh, in the field of conservation, let it be the pig, pigment paintings. Uh, I, I, actually, I am working on the how to clean the paintings with the enzymes. I am using biological things, bio, bio cleaning. Uh, I, 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 it was wonderful for me to see that how the Janjira and uh, Janjira and Fort uh, Placer it survived uh, in the sea, and why not to use that technique to for the other uh, monuments by the plasters of India? So those things are there that we can see it. So I think that we should have a joint efforts. Uh, with uh, uh, with the panelists, uh, with the with all the laboratories, and uh, uh, try something to synthesize something that uh, to come out with a good uh, uh, facilities, good lab, good collaborations. And I am I am I am thinking that if we we collaborate uh, with a very good uh, way and these things uh, with the uh, your uh, Mittal Institute, I think we can do something very good for our uh, region. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would just like to, that was a very excellent uh, point made by Managing Singh about the excellent work they've done. I would also like to point out that, there, you know, there are inherent problems in terms of actually, uh, you know, um, uh, enthusing, let's say, people to actually take to conservation science as a profession. That always seems to be a problem because of the future prospects. And you'll find that many museums are also understaffed. And even for instance, when we are able to get, if and when we are able to get grants to get research assistance and so on, typically if they come from a scientific discipline, they are sort of eventually also looking to, maybe they want to do this for a while, but they want actually to go abroad and get a proper job with a scientific uh, research laboratory or whatever. I mean, that mindset that this can provide a career or if they come in from an uh, artistry disposition and they're not that inclined to get into the scientific, so this is, it, it's a bit more complex and whether we need to make it easier for, you know, maybe to get interns, like for instance, I was also having a conversation with uh, at some point with the curator in the government museum Chennai and they were saying they are quite understaffed, but then, you know, when they need to clean the bronzes and all that, you know, how else can they manage? So, you know, is there some way in which they can just get interns who can come you know, who just do it as part of their BTEC or their B, whatever it is, and so on, and just come and, uh, you know, get trained to clean some objects. Because they have that enthusiasm at that age and so on. And you know, after a point, it gets harder to. So these are, I think, some of the challenges of when, you know, we work more closely, how we can get the, the, the people to get enthused and see a future also in this subject and so on beyond uh, this. Can I add something? Um... I just wanted to jump in and probably pick up from where uh, Manager Singh um, you know, left off. I think what he said uh, you know, is, is excellent. So 
Um, you know, I, I think if you're looking at a conservation science program, you know, my view is we do have a system in place where scientists are employed in institutions where you have collections, whether it's sites or whether it's museums, it is part of the recruitment system where a PhD in something, in a science background, gets them in. Changing the system is not easy, you know, because you've got to go through public service commission. There's a whole range of issues. What I think would be good is how do you slowly get them to understand what conservation science is? That means the kind of research you do is not just basic research. It is how you apply the research so that at the end, you are doing something for the long-term preservation of a collection. How do you bring you know, the hypothesis building right? It's, and, 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 and make sure you know, they understand some of the ethical issues. I mean, a whole range of other issues are there, right? And I think if, if at all you're looking at, at doing something in, in, in the short term, at least in the next decade, I think that would be ideal because you'll have thousands of people who are in the system, who are excellent scientists. If their productivity can be channeled in a way that the field would benefit, you know, I think that would be great. I mean, they come from such prestigious institutions. So I, I, I would you know, strong, strongly urge you know, both CSMBS and the Mittal to, to think a little bit in the direction, not to go from scratch to develop a conservation scientist from scratch. The second one is, I also think as part of this whole thing, it'll be good to pick two or three things that are of national importance at this stage. I'll give you a simple example. There's a lot of debate here on objects that disappear from here into other parts of the world. There's a whole bunch of things on provenance, trying to figure out where they came from, you know, et cetera. If you can actually get some of the science to be focused in that direction that will give it a lot of live, live light. And, and people would really think, look, oh, well, there's a conservation scientist who's doing that. It's an important one. Only then you, you kind of build that political, you know, strength ultimately to get, you know, more people into that sector. And same with, with, with when you do research, it'll be good to do with local artists. I mean, if it's an India, Indian artist, you know, if it's to in Sri Lanka, it could be, you know, Sri Lankan artists, because then the, the, the local impact, uh, you know, would be, would be high. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's much more trying to work with the current system and, and trying to see how, how you could, you know, build on it. I, I also think, um, you know, there is also a whole range of other needs that are going to come up right now. Uh, this COVID is going to have such an impact on the sector that the sector is going to be starved of funds for the next five years at least, you know, in, 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 a, in a broad way. So what do you do with regard to environmental standards? How do you keep collections right? How do you minimize risk? So there's a whole range of areas, you know, where, where conservation science can contribute. So I think just, just to be practical, I mean, I just wanted to throw a few examples, you know, just to illustrate my point. Yeah, I would just add to what Vinod said on terms of provenance, because that was partly why I find that a lot of people keep inviting me to talk because some of the work I'd done on the lead isotope analysis on the Chola bronzes and so on, it has helped to, you know, maybe at least make uh, some uh, progress in this terms of, you know, the provenance and uh, um, identification, authentication of bronzes and so on. So there is, as you say, a lot of uh, public interest in these kinds of things, of course. But uh, the public interest also has to be matched by, I think, the support as well. So how we generate and, you know, augment it. But I think it's a great beginning here, an initiative and so on. So, and one could, you know, look forward to continued direction from the CSVMS and NRLC and so on in these areas. And as we know, also pointed out. I'd like to jump in here for just uh, the follow up on the excellent points that and, uh, Dr. Singh and uh, Vinod and Sharada made uh, just to uh, kind of emphasize the importance of collaboration that uh, it's not going to, we can't just find that one person or one specialist, the conservation scientist to carry the torch and actually like make it happen. It really does need to be based on collaboration. And I was just recently reading an essay in studies and conservation that 
was on Islamic manuscripts based in, um, in Istanbul and uh, where this uh, researcher, a conservator was uh, writing on a, a, a unique sort of set of cases from this uh, 13th century Islamic manuscript. But often what's done in museums are uh, first aid, right? It's salvage archeology span mentality. So it's always just something you just have to fix it or preserve it and like, fix the problem and then move on. So what she was pointing out is, you know, you really do need kind of collaboration between scientists, conservator, art historians, curators to really kind of have a research agenda and really probe the case and actually sort of, you know, you, you have to have a bigger picture to uh, sort of, you know, just not based on just one case that was in that lab that's very individual, but this actually has like much larger and bigger ramification for preservation of that type of object. And you really do need to have kind of network uh, of people working on the same type of object or same type of issues to kind of communicate and have sort of research agenda. And, you know, Dr. Singh has uh, published so much on Ajanta's murals and it's also, and, and clusters and so that was kind of, you know, research-based study that was done for years, right? And that was possible because he's passionate about it and you actually have the, you know, the, the amount of research that's done is kind of research-based and topic-based, whereas uh, a lot of cases, especially for museum-based collections, it's going to be kind of mode of first aid. And I think it is important to kind of establish this kind of uh, channel for communication. And COVID-19, despite all these disasters that have uh, created, it actually opened up a possibility to have this open channel of communications amongst like really large body of, uh, you know, group of people. So I think it's a, it's a chance uh, that we can actually start communicating and actually open a like Slack channel or something of different topics and actually have people from different institutions to ask questions and actually have sort of research topics that come out of different institutions come together and have discussions uh, lively. I think that's, uh, there is an opportunity for that, uh, especially based in South Asia. And one thing I want to add uh, from what uh, Sharada, you mentioned about the crafts and living tradition, I think that actually is really important aspect of understanding conservation, research-based conservation in South Asia that is lacking in museums or elsewhere in, uh, in the world that, you know, I was so impressed by the conservators here at Harvard and MFA when they're working on paper-based objects that, you know, flat works, that they have to kind of go through the, process of recreating the object to understand what has happened to it, right? Whereas you have a living tradition that really does kind of preserve that kind of knowledge. And so working together with that kind of community really is a, a golden opportunity for understanding the past and present and to the future. So I think that's also where the value of conservation, research-based conservation comes in to kind of bring together different types of communities, not only the conservation scientists and researchers and art historians, but the living artists. So I uh, really appreciate that uh, you guys actually brought that point. So thank you. Yes, also, and uh, actually in, um... Uh, research, uh, research, conservation treatment based research and also technical based research, both uh, we need to develop. Uh, also in, um, uh, I am normally doing some uh, annual workshop with Sri Lankan custom because of they have a lot of problems for treasure hunting and export uh, artifacts. So custom officer cannot uh, identify exact uh, artifact, uh, what is the exact one and uh, so authenticity of the artifact. So they uh, started with me to doing some application of uh, radiography or some uh, new technology to identify artifact. So as a start, I uh, uh, start uh, uh, Sri Lankan uh, Atomic Energy Authority, we start uh, some X radiography workshop with the uh, bronze object. So, uh, my actually, I have some idea to make a database. Uh, so, uh, and including some X radi radiograph uh, and some uh, photograph and uh, things. 
So uh, because of X-radiography is a fingerprint, so we can identify uh, object, uh, each object. So like this uh, uh, research-based uh, uh, program, I uh, generally graphed, uh, but uh, it is can't do individually. So we want to connect with other research in, in institution like Atomic Energy Authority, some kind of uh, things. So in Sri Lanka, main uh, problem is uh, uh, scientific uh, based uh, conservation laboratory and instrument and some funding. Uh, so in um, I received some two, three uh, grant from uh, U.S. Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation. So uh, we did some uh, workshop. Uh, we know Daniel also helped us to do some preventive conservation workshop with us. So in uh, so funding also problem with us. I think and, uh, Anusha is right. Anusha is. I think Anusha is very right in you know flagging these issues because. This also came up when you mentioned ASI's authenticity questions come up and Sharda and Anusha, you're looking at fingerprinting tech, you know, uh, programs for artifact identification as well as authentication. And uh, another thing that comes up is I'll pick up a few comments that have come in from some of our audiences because we have 10 minutes now. Uh, one is that concern, um, you, most of you are aware of Sanjay, Sanjay Dhar. Uh, he's one of the leading art conservation practitioners in the country and also a thinking mind. Uh, he feels that sometimes, you know, we're looking at uh, conservation science as a very high-tech resource and that um, whether to have it or not to have it. Um, but uh, Sanjay feels that uh, we need to talk about inculcating scientific temper. He calls it a desire for inquiry on how to address issues with available means and to bring that into our curricula, you know? And then as Vinod mentioned, you know, to uh, collaborate then with other institutions, you know? There are enough examples of collaboration, Sanjay says, but I think it is about bringing these two things together. Talking about bringing two things together, um, um, Zaina Nasi feels that, um, uh, you know, the way science is taught in institutions, where it's only science. And this is something that has come from the past three decades to us. And those in the humanities are siloed in humanities. Uh, but the Ministry of Education did come up uh, with the concept of Sandhi as in coming together of the sciences and humanities. So at least in India as such, I think already in the IITs, humanities is becoming a, a necessary um, stream of the science education. Similarly, the sciences would become a stream in the humanities education. So that is being addressed. But what is also interesting is um, um, another message that came up, and I think that was from Mr. Avdan, from Mr. Sandesh Avdan, was that um, um, uh, how can museum pedagogy help to um, um, involve more people into conservation? If you look at the new education policy, and if you're looking at developing new training programs in India, um, how can we bring museum pedagogy into schools curriculum? And I think uh, this, con this program also for uh, science, uh, conservation science, I think this too has to look at while one addresses it at a level, professional level, are there ways you want to do forward links with, you know, younger school level and undergraduate level and postgraduate level? I think it has to be a multi-pronged effort in that context. Um, so um, I think if you, uh, we're, going to, we're going to close in about five, six minutes. So if you have some thought about for the next generation in terms of, we have flagged a lot of issues during this panel discussion. We've flagged um, uh, limitations of our various uh, nation states, so to speak, or rather our, our subcontinent, you know. And uh, we have uh, given some examples of how these things can be addressed. But um, if you feel there are some, um, you know, things that we can now uh, direct our training program into as uh, your, your thoughts for this panel discussion, uh, you know, a quick, concise, a minute each, and uh, we will then uh, close the 
conversation because mr mukherji also sent a message and he said that when you're talking about south asia you're talking about a lot of objects which are delicately he called it delicately wrapped with multiple layers of human histories he said when you have objects like that can we just approach everything straight with a scientific this thing without any sensitivity towards it and uh, this was something with manager singh also brought up when he was talking about the ajanta paintings and can we as scientists just go straight away you know and addressing the multiple layers of fantastic techniques and other things uh, so his question is how do you develop a conservation training program that um, that transmits a certain amount of sense and sensibility i think so it is these ancillary things also that have to be developed in training programs right okay. so uh, we have 5 minutes to close it on the dot so quick remarks on uh, yes education can i start can i start with just three you know very yeah. quick points um, and a book so you know just to summarize you know my thinking on this whole issue i've already mentioned this before i think one core need is how to make a scientist into a conservation scientist right i think if something could be done it will be a huge benefit these are people who are full time you know employed to do science it will benefit yeah. the cultural heritage of any yeah. of the country in south asia tremendously the Very second true. thing is how do you do basic science whether you're taking a sample how do you you know do a basic hypothesis testing etc if that skill could be brought in to a conservator or a collection care professional when they are working with an object right then they'll do it right so i think that skill is needed because end of the day when you're restoring a painting whatever you're doing you want certain things clarified and if they can understand the basics of science in doing that i think that will be a huge benefit the third thing is i i'm not sure whether getting you know millions and millions of dollars of equipment and centralizing in one location will give you all the answers when these equipments are there in the premier institutions which do maintain it and it works it's it's great to have you know an rlc as a core which does fantastic work but i think replicating that you know would be too expensive but there is is there are iits and you know in the institute of science and major universities how do you get them to understand that there is a great need in this area even if each of them work on one or two projects they'll understand what the needs are of the sector you know because these are practical projects whether it's in a phd level or a masters level so getting them into the system means you have the equipment you got things to do you know where where you know you have certain people out there who understand what the needs are so these are my three practical you know thank you thank you very much vinod we've listed all of these down gina would you like to say something sure well Well, I just follow up on the Bino's excellent points that I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and I think what we're kind of aiming at thinking about this kind of training program uh, right now, I think is what you pointed out as a sort of second point, uh, sort of having conservation conservators or conservation sort of collection care uh, people to be knowledgeable and actually trained to be able to ask the kind of questions that need to be asked and also be able to kind of do basic or scientific sort analysis based uh, conservation so i think that's more of a reasonable goal to um, pursue and in terms of your third point about sort of the kind of working with different regional institutions right just not i mean there is a nrlc that's a wonderful core but yes uh, you need resources to go around the subcontinent and one of the uh, sort of ideas that i have to pursue is really thinking about mobile heritage lab that will kind of address different aspects that can actually go to under resourced areas and and that are much needed so i i'm hoping to open kind of a dialogue and actually maybe hold a workshop to kind of brainstorm this idea to develop a mobile heritage lab in uh south asia so that's what i would actually propose okay. manager singh ji some thoughts on education are related to conservation research and science uh i have one point to say that i just one minute i will take that uh, 
uh, we have developed a, a technique how to clean bad excreta from the tempera paintings. And that is, there is no, absolutely, there is no methods all over the world. I have got a patent just few months back. I have got a patent to that. So if anybody is interested to clean the bad excreta from the paintings, we are always there to help them. That is what I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anusha and then Sharda. Uh, actually, uh, annually we receive a lot of uh, archaeological intern. So uh, generally, easily, uh, we can add uh, that curriculum more scientific discipline. Uh, so uh, according to that, that uh, so they working with artifacts, they can uh, develop some scientific discipline and uh, artifact conservation and cultural heritage thing. That's the main idea because of I have a lot of experience working with the intern, archaeological intern. They have enough art, uh, fine arts uh, and iconography and other uh, aspect of the art subject knowledge, but they, have in, they haven't enough uh, chemistry base or uh, some some scientific uh, discipline. So uh, my my suggestion is a more at uh, scientific discipline with archaeological uh, undergraduate student curriculum. It is a uh, very helpful for uh, in future uh, more than more than school uh, school student curriculum. Hmm. So now, talking about um, Anusha talking about school curriculum. I'm glad you brought this very important point because Alison Gilchrist, who's with Yale at the moment, she uh, has given some examples in the United States where, uh, where you know, youth from local communities are being connected with museum conservation practices in the Native American and the First Nations context. Yeah. And she feels that it has strong mutual benefit for integrating indigenous knowledge into conservation practice while attracting younger students to training in the field. And a lot of a lot of members of the audience have actually uh, corroborated this aspect of bringing science, education, and scientific temper right from childhood. So maybe as an ancillary, this is also something that we can look upon if you're looking at it with a missionary sort of uh, approach about things. And a lot of people from other continents, um, Maggie from Maggie Lopser from South Africa, and um, other 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 countries are appreciating this conversation because they find resonance with the issues that are here with us. So um, Sharda, uh, may I have the pleasure of requesting you for uh, you know, closing remarks. Uh, we are two minutes off schedule, but just one remark from you and then we will close this uh, evening. Mute. Sharda, sound. Sorry, yes. Thank you so much, Anupam, and I'll try and maybe quickly just make uh, 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 maybe two or three remarks. Oh, well, rather just one, but in different aspects of the same. Well, uh, mainly to say that, uh, you know, that we have to, of course, on the one hand, convey the grandeur of the heritage and the historiography, but also the scientific temper, that is a very important point, and the fact that, you know, the materiality and the fact that, you know, one uh, has to contextualize within the you know, heritage across the world, whether it's the great traditions or also the, um, as you mentioned, First Nation and so many other, the, you know, the um, uh, across different kind of socioeconomic strata and so on. So the sense of this. And the other thing is also this is a unique subject, which also brings together a, a sort of coming together of high technology and low technology, as it were. You do need the high uh, technology of publications, maybe in all the top journals and so on. But then there is, we've already talked about the craft and Jina also spoke a lot about that. And, you know, they're also affected during COVID and all. And for instance, we also tried to have these workshop experimental lines melting or bronze casting where the where the craftspeople can also come into communication with the student community, which was the kind of thing perhaps we never had in IIT where you just do the blackboard work and all, but this aspect of the practical uh, interactions with the resources, the empirical knowledge of 
the craftspeople and so on. And finally, of course, I think also what tends to happen is we tend to see, look at the behemoth institutions like the look up to, you know, where they, they maybe all the governmental institutions or the museums or the IITs, but there needs to be also some mechanism for reaching out and making funds available for the smaller universities and the colleges and, you know, even at, and we, we did try and, for instance, make a start. Uh, I was also involved with the committee for DST, which is trying to also fund these uh, subjects to some extent in cultural heritage. So these kinds of uh, thing where there is more of resources made available, it doesn't have to be a lot, but still even a little for researchers, uh, you know, across different types of institutions and um, so on, that would also be one direction. Thank, Thank you, so you much. very much. Thank you very much. And before I close, um, Vinod, I will of course ask you for one thing. Um, um, that, um, uh, one thing, two things to emphasize. One of the things is that uh, there is the great importance of temper for historical inquiries. Sanjay Dhar mentioned this thing about creating a scientific temper, this, 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 con this thing about inquiry, this culture of inquiry, but also for historical inquiry. Scientific, the material inquiry of things as well as the um, the art historical and intangible aspects of inquiries. I think all that has to be wrapped up together. And the other thing that, Vinod, um, 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 I thank everybody for being with us on the panel and I I close, I, I uh, have the, um, I would like to close this by asking Vinod just one thing um, because his work transcends um, administration and the sciences and actual practical implementation of things. How is it that the administrators, we're talking about the scientists and the conservators, what about the administrators who may not have had the time and they're, because they're burdened with a lot of other things and they may not actually have had time to be engaged or nobody has communicated to them the importance of this field. Of course, we are thinking it's very important, this field, but for an administrator of an institution, what are the few things that we can have, we can keep in mind to convey to them the importance of this field and so that they are with with this together because without their uh, buy into this i don't think it's going to cut any ice in any institution creating either a lab or a conservation science program or anything and that we close it at that yes Sound, you know. Yeah, no, I won't, I won't take too much time, but one point I mentioned before is I think you've got to pick a few projects that would have resonance. So the one I mentioned before was, you know, right now there's so much talk on provenance and objects coming back and it's in the media every day. So if you can pick two or three projects, then I think right from you know, the directors to the secretaries to the administration, they will know that this field exists and it's quite important. I mean, all the rest, I mean, I know we all know how important it is, but sometimes how do you pick the right opportunity to convey to, you know, people? And I, I would, you know, probably I won't take too much time, but I think just, just being politically smart, you know, to put it out there, I think it's quite important. The second bit also is, there are certain flagship projects that would be of great interest for the administration. And I think the positive contribution you can make to those projects would also bring things to the limelight. I'm not going to list any of them, but in, in a broad way, I think you know ultimately that would get to the ears of the people who made nations. Excellent. With that, I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank the ladies and gentlemen who've been in the audience with us and the organizers and uh, Salman for, uh, you know, hosting this whole um, uh, event technically for us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and we will definitely continue, continue this conversation uh, later on.